So computers are getting way faster and way more complicated. I mean, you look at the new M1 chips from Apple, they're insane. I think I heard recently that Dell is shoving 12 or 14 cores into their new XPS. And, you know, as these computers become faster and faster and the chips become bigger and more complicated, programming languages are becoming increasingly abstract. And I think it's very easy for programmers to start divorcing themselves from the realities of the computer hardware itself. And while you can make a case that that's good and that's fine, I think it's good to kind of have some knowledge as to how things are working under the hood. So what is a computer? Put very simply, a computer is a device that operates on memory. So the computer chip, it can read data in from some kind of memory element. It can write to the memory element, and then it performs all sorts of arithmetic and bitwise operations on those data values. So that includes addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, you know, bit shifts to the right, bit shifts to the left, you know, jumps for conditional a program execution or for loops, you know, basically anything the IC designer fancies to implement or someone in the business department tells them to implement can be implemented and it exists on these chips. So high level languages like C, Perl, and Julia get compiled into these basic instructions that the IC designer put in and then executed on the hardware. You know, there are other languages like Python that are interpreted, but that's a different topic. In the end, everything's running on these uh, executable instruction sets. But while it's great that the processor has memory it can operate on, you know, we need some manner of getting stuff into and out of said memory. So what we do is we take some registers or some, some parts of this memory and we memory map it. We allocate them to specific peripherals. As they're just essentially reserved just for that device, a physical device. And so these peripherals like keyboards, monitors, microphones, speakers, they convert between some physical stimuli and digital values in these addresses. So we can put the data in the register and then the CPU can go and read the data out and you know do whatever it wants with it. Or the computer can take some data and then put it into this register and then the peripheral takes that data and regurgitates it back to us in some kind of human-friendly format. For example, like a speaker takes some series of digital values and plays a waveform. So here's a, like a basic example for how this works. This is a pretty basic script I wrote in C. Arguably it's a little high level for this, but uh, we'll deal with it. So to start off, I just use a printf function, which is a standard system call, to ask you to enter two numbers. Then I use scanf, which is another uh, function call in the standard library, to do a formatted scan on input. So it read, looks for two integers, as the percent %d percent %d is for, then reads those two values into the address at address input one and address input two. So those two variables then have the values that were entered in by the user. Then there's another printf and I go and I print the result, you know, doing some math on it. So this is doing a couple of the things that we just discussed. So the printf is taking this string of letters and it's putting, it's computing whatever pixel values need to be output, putting those in a register and that's getting read to the screen where we can actually see, you know, please enter two numbers. Then we have scanf, which is looking at what we're typing into the terminal. So whenever we hit a key on the keyboard, it's recorded into a buffer that the terminal holds. And the scanf is looking through that buffer and it's taking is recognizing certain bit patterns and it's saving that into the internal memory that is input one and input two. When I go to this printf function at the end, I'm doing some math. So it's computing, first it computes what the sum of these two values are. So it's looking at the two registers and then it's calculating the sum and it's putting the sum in a temporary, you know, caching register. And then it goes and it does the same thing it did earlier where it generates a series of characters 
it puts those characters in some kind of buffer, and then that gets put in the memory where it gets printed to the screen where we can see it. So it's a simple little program. It does a couple small things here that you can kind of see how the memory is being read in and read out in terms of characters into the character buffer in the terminal. And you can see me executing it here and just kind of running it. So the way peripherals are designed and worked is really interesting and it's a hugely diverse field that encompasses a lot of different disciplines. You know, one example would be audio equipment and getting those to meet certain requirements. You know, that's a huge field. However, I'd like to go in a little bit more detail about the computer chip and the types of memory that we attach to it. So there are a lot of physical and technological limitations to implementing a memory element. A memory element being, you know, something that holds its value for some period of time. And so there are trade-offs between the size, the speed, the cost, and, you know, different technologies that are used, as well as memory that are volatile, which means when they lose power, they forget everything, and non-volatile, which means that when power is removed, it's still going to have the data on it, like a hard drive. And so we mix and match these different memories depending on what we want them to do in the computer system. We have the memory that's really close to the CPU, that's the cache, which generally is pretty small and it's really expensive, but it's also really fast. So when the CPU needs something, it can get what it needs. Then there's the RAM, which is just nearby the CPU. So it's pretty fast, but it's bigger. It's not as expensive. You know, you can buy a RAM module for 50, 100 bucks. It's pretty, pretty sizable. And then we have the stuff that's far away, like a hard disk drive or a solid state drive. You know, these are pretty slow, but also huge and kind of more of a peripheral. Um, but it, it lands on that spectrum. And so when we go and compile some kind of program, it gets confer converted into machine code and stored as CPU-specific machine code in one of these memory elements. And then the CPU scrolls through that and it executes these instructions one by one. Generally, we group this memory into two categories in regards to what the CPU is doing. There's the instruction memory, which holds the instructions and is generally read-only. And then there's the data or runtime memory, which holds all of the values, the constants, and the variables that are being generated while the code is executing. Now these can be one piece of memory. These can be a ROM and a RAM of some sort, so two separate chips. Uh, these are just kind of abstract groupings that we place. So the CPU will also have a couple registers inside of itself that just are used for physically performing operations. And some memory space is also devoted to the different peripherals that are attached to this system. Uh, you'll probably deal with this more if you work in any kind of embedded environment. Uh, it's a little bit low level for something like a desktop machine, for example. So looking back at the example, da, da, da. So this example is a little bit more complicated. I'm using a library called ncurses here, which allows me to manually control the terminal. So instead of letting the terminal do all of the printing and the scanning, I have to do a little bit more of that manually. So to start with, you know, just some initialization, I'm creating an input character variable. So this program, it just takes in a character from the user, prints it to the screen. That's it. No addition, nothing. So first, I ask the user, you know, type a letter, push it to the screen, and then I go into this while loop where I'm waiting for input. And so essentially what this is doing is this is polling, repeatedly looking at some register associated with the keyboard and saying, do you have a value, do you have a value, do you have a value, over and over and over again. And every single time that value isn't um, a character or uh, some kind of digit, which is less than 43, greater than 26, is the ASCII codes, A-S-C-I-I, -I. it just goes and it asks again. So it just keeps waiting until the user hits a key on the keyboard that's accepted. Once that key is hit, this get ch or get car command function takes whatever's in the keyboard register and saves it or puts that value into the input variable in memory. And then it goes and it, you know, takes that value and it does a formatted print to the screen as a car at 236 on the terminal window. It formats that so it you know, adjusts the screen buffer that we're writing in, which is this allocation of memory that 
pull's going to be on the screen before we actually push it to the proper screen. And so we set up all this memory to hold whatever we want to say, you know, press any key to exit, and then we use refresh to actually push that memory from a buffer to the actual screen memory where the peripheral, which is our monitor, takes, takes those values and shows it to us. And then, then we close the window and close the program. So a little bit more involved, you can kind of see a little bit more under the hood in terms of what's going on. I hope this is useful, or at least mildly interesting. There's an incredible amount of nuance and complexity in this field if you go and look for it. Uh, it's pretty easy to find and it's really deep. Uh, you know, there are computers that have read-only memory to hold the instructions. There's single blocks of RAM that are divided between the instructions and the data. You know, some have programs that run on, quote-unquote, the bare metal, uh, which is embedded firmware. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are computers like our desktops and laptops that run full-on operating systems that take care of an innumerable number of tasks that we just running in the background that we don't have to think about. You know, and then there's in the middle somewhere, there's something called an RTOS, or real-time operating system, uh, which is in the embedded world, but you have some faculties that are done for you in terms of controlling the different peripherals and timing and, you know, interrupts. You know, maybe I'll look into it someday.